life Whether you're ready or not Sometimes it's rough And it takes all that you've got But he's been here Just waiting for you to knock So take his hand Hi, welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight our guest is Father Gabriel Gillen, a Dominican who's in charge of Kindly Light Production Studio. Uh, the network has aired some of his videos. Uh, you might have seen them. He works with NYU students in making these videos about the faith. And also he's recently uh, come across an old film of Fulton Sheen and uh, his preaching. So we'll be talking about Sheen and uh, some of uh, uh, Sheen's, we'll be speaking about Fulton Sheen and his preaching and his theology tonight. We're also joined uh, by the Lyceum School uh, representatives from the school. If you remember last week at uh, St. Mark's Feast Day, on St. Mark's Feast Day, they uh, sang a beautiful Mass, a Palestrina Mass for us, just extraordinary. So we wanted to pull you guys on the show and just hear a little bit about your school and uh, tell us uh, where you're located and uh, the philosophy behind your school. Uh, well, we're located in South Euclid, Ohio, just, just, um, just outside of um, U uh, Cleveland. And I should say you're Mark Langley, the academic dean, academic dean. and Luke Masick, a headmaster. So that's right. Okay. And the, the school is, is, is built on, it's called the Lyceum because that's the uh, name of the school that Aristotle uh, started in Athens, beautiful grove, and he gathers students and they would uh, go around talking about important questions and um, talking with the master, Aristotle, right, the right. philosopher. Right. And uh, I think they probably did a lot of singing in that grove. <laughs> <laughs> So you teach a classics program, and I will bring Mr. Masick in on this. We do. We uh, teach uh, the, the great books. The students uh, read things like the Iliad and uh, the Odyssey and the Aeneid, and uh, they read a little bit of Plato's Republic, mm -hmm. um, and we discuss those things in the classroom uh, with the students, so we don't have lecture <laughs> classes. And I heard that the, uh, the debates can get intense. I talked to a few of the students, and... Uh, <laughs> It, it's, you know, discussion means to shake things up and things, things get sh shooken up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know. uh, so there's, there's, a, there's vibrant, vibrant discussion, vibrant debate. I think uh, right. Renee and Ben can uh, testify right. to that. Well, we can pass the mic to Renee. Tell us about the music program. That was really extraordinary, which you all uh, did last week with the choir. Um, that seemed like it takes a lot of time, a big commitment. Is that the case? Yes, it is definitely a discipline, but you know, we're working for a perfection, and that, that perfection in the music, our goal with that is to really bring people to another place when, when attending Mass or, you know, or our concerts, so. Okay, and after the Mass last week, we recorded an additional song, so we're gonna roll that video for you now.
<laughs> oh, that's great. Um, Ben, let me ask you, what, what has been your favorite course at the Lyceum? Uh, my favorite course was uh, Euclid freshman year. Uh, that was an amazing class because you started with principles and common notions like the whole is greater than the part and then you got to move on to things and then I ended up proving like the Pythagorean theorem which was just amazing to do. Yeah. And uh, the music part of it, was that uh, something that blessed you? The music part was great because uh, my family, I have eight other siblings so we didn't really have extra money to throw around for music lessons so with this I got to learn the best music there was Mozart and yeah. and Bach and stuff like that and I got to learn how to sing better than I would have anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> and how has the great books, I'll throw this to you Renee as well, uh, helped you with your faith? Well I would have to say that there are two ways you can come to know God. One is through your emotions and through your heart. You know you can have a really be feeling really moved to and feel God's presence sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. But then there's another way, and that's in your mind and, and in the truth that you learn. And so by going to the Lyceum and learning all the kinds of great books mm -hmm. that we read and learning truth, it really acts as a foundation for my life, for all the students' life, when our emotions fluctuate and go all over the place. Right, you know, right. we need that truth, and that's right. what we get here at the Lyceum. Amen. Well, thanks so much uh, for singing for us and uh, sharing your time with us. We'll be right back with Father Gabriel Gillen, so don't go away. Back in a moment. back. Thank you for being with us. I'm Doug Berry along with Father Mark. We are the Rock House Compadres. This is the best place you could be since you're with us here tonight. And thank you for being here. We have with us tonight Father Gabriel Gillen. Father, great to have you on the great program. Great to be here. Thank you very much. This is the Rock House and you probably know this because it's, it's, it's quite a journey to get here. It is. We had it's to blindfold you <laughs> because we can't show everybody where we're at. We're up in the mountains. We're obviously, if you've watched this show at all, you know by looking out the window that it is the same time of the day every show oh. year round it's, it's a, a mystery it's a special place it's a very special <laughs> place thank you father i agree it is yes but good to have you on the show now tonight's topic uh, uh really is focusing on on the venerable now archbishop fulton sheen that's exciting um, but before we get to that let's talk a little bit about yourself uh yeah. you have quite an interesting past as well uh you are a priest since 2000 yes a new millennium priest but you weren't always interested in the priesthood. No, I, when I went away to college, I started to drift from the faith. I went to a state university, and then I was a stockbroker for about four years on Wall Street. And one day I was home and I heard a really good homily, and the priest was preaching on St. Augustine, and our hearts are restless till they rest in thee, O Lord. And I was struck by the fact that 300, uh, the year 300, they were speaking about the same things that youth today are speaking about the searching for truth, goodness, and beauty, but how our hearts are restless. Even if we had all the good things in this world, we would want more. Uh, we have an infinite desire for things, and God can only satisfy that. So the priest, when he said that, it really spoke to my heart because I was working, I was doing well, I was doubling my income every year, and I saw that the, the people that were a little bit older, I was in my early 20s, the people that were in their early 30s were doing much better than you know, uh, I ever thought I would do, but I knew I was on the same track. And uh, most of them weren't very happy, and that was disturbing me. They were shattering my image of the American dream and what would make me happy. So I began searching in different places. I, the last place I looked was my own backyard, my own Catholicism, but when I found it, I knew it was true. Wow, that's incredible. And uh, you think Bishop. about doubling your money? Is yeah. that what it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because my next question is, no how, do I, how do I get this? I'm, sorry. I'm out of touch. <laughs> sorry. That's it. But it is incredible because you know you you've been on really both sides of the spectrum, if you will, of that American dream and, and Wall Street stock market. Because you were in New York City, you were in the, in the real blood and guts 
of the financial world. I was trained in the World Trade Center and um, uh, fortunately lost some friends uh, wow. on September 11th. And I think a lot of people after September 11th, but other things as well, make you start to look at the big questions. And there was a series of things that made me start thinking of the bigger questions in life uh, versus what you're usually presented in the media subtly or not so subtly. And uh, it was something that when you begin that path and you start seeking for truth and if you ask God, you know, um, to reveal himself to you, he will. And you can come into that joy that God had prepared for you from the mm -hmm. beginning. There's an interesting point you make too about the fact that at Augustine's time he was realizing the restless heart and you mentioned even today, and isn't that what a lot of our, our, our even poetry and modern music and such is about people who are searching and looking for something and he, did, and he didn't start out with the best of intentions. He started listening to St. Ambrose uh, because of his skills as a public speaker and he wanted to learn from that so he could be a better public speaker and a lawyer basically. And, but then he started listening to the content of it as well <laughs> and that started speaking to his All heart. Right. And, uh, mm. It's kind of neat when you look back and think you had St. Ambrose, St. Monica, St. Augustine, all these saints hanging out together, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? It's a lot of saints and, uh, yeah. and, and I think it's very encouraging. Uh, I was a big fan when I began studying for the priesthood. Uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen was one of my favorite authors. Mm -hmm. Anything I could read on him I read in audio tapes and videotapes I, I would watch, EWTN's, you know, uh, Life is Worth Living series. And uh, you develop a friendship with particular mm -hmm. saints and they're there for your journey. Uh, Pope Benedict the 16th, our Holy Father uh, Emeritus, spoke about that reality of uh, choosing a saint, a friend. There's all different, you don't have to, you know, find one friend and uh, we have different personalities as did the saints and we're drawn to that friendship and it's, it's nice when you see little hints of that friendship of the saint in your own life, in your daily life as well. So mm -hmm. I, I always encourage people to pick a saint and develop that friendship, read about them, speak with them in prayer, ask them to draw you closer to God as they were drawn closer to God. And they had the same struggles that we've had and the same joys and they can rejoice with us and help us through difficult times as well. Mm -hmm. so. Let me ask you, what would you tell like the stockbroker today who's working on Wall Street? He's restless. You had a call to leave, become a priest. Maybe he doesn't have that call. How does he find God on Wall Street? Yeah, I always tell people, uh, well, I actually get to preach down on Wall Street. Every so often, uh, I, I'm asked to cover a Mass on a Holy Day of Obligation. And a lot of people do attend Mass mm -hmm. uh, around uh, Wall Street. Our Lady of Victory Church, uh, Elizabeth Ann Seton has a shrine there, <laughs> Blessed uh, Elizabeth, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, near the Statue of Liberty where you catch the ferries, mm -hmm. uh, Our Lady of the Rosary. So I've been down there preaching, and, and I've, I tried to be attentive to that. I always encourage people to, first of all, uh, read certain things, but even before that, to spend time in front of the Blessed Sacrament and uh, just spend an hour with God. I also encourage people, if they haven't been to the Sacrament of Reconciliation, to go there mm -hmm. because that opens up our ears, it opens up our hearts, and uh, that's a, a great foundation. And uh, if they do those certain things, then God himself will, will lead them. You deeper. know, I, well, I asked that question because I was rec a youth minister told me recently that she found like a, a lot of young people feel like to be a Christian almost, that you have to enter a monastery today. Yeah. But yeah. I, that was the, one of the saddest things I've heard. You know, yeah, no, if exactly. we lose that confidence that you know, we can't be a Christian wherever today, that's a, a terrible thing. A, a uh, third order Dominican, a lay person, is uh, blessed Pier Giorgio Fersati, mm -hmm. and he was somebody who uh, lived out that life as a lay person. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just, there's many different uh, saints that are there to encourage us and have walked all different paths of vocations. Mm -hmm. Before we move on to Fulton Sheen, I know we got a clip here we're going to cut to in just a bit here. I'm curious, what drew you to the Dominican order? I was reading, ultimately, G.K. Chesterton. I, I first read his book on St. Francis. I studied at Franciscan University of Steubenville, and I, I read, I always had a devotion to St. Francis, and I really loved that. And I encourage people to do that today, especially with our Pope Francis. Um, <coughs> reading Chesterton on Francis, St. Francis, is wonderful. And then the next book I read, was one on St. Thomas Aquinas. And when I read uh, about that, there was something that really drew me to that spirituality that mm. Chesterton kind of intuited. Yeah, he didn't read the Summa inside and out. He didn't read all the works of St. Thomas Aquinas, but even great scholars of St. Thomas Aquinas realized that Chesterton knew Thomas Aquinas better than you know some scholars did. Mm. And uh, so that's, 
it was just, I, so I, I, I encourage people to read, no matter what the, your spirituality you're drawn to, to read. I think G.K. Chesterton is, is a great person. And you know, Father, I mean, we're about to get into some you know, good Fulton Sheen material here, um, and what a dynamic personality this man had. Um, you know, and his, his cause for beatification is, you know, is, is moving, it's rolling. Father Andrew uh, Postoli is, is, the, right. is the one uh, moving that cause forward and it's going well. Yeah, and, and to see, his, you know, Fulton Sheen's personality was so dynamic and so engaging. Um, and as you mentioned, there's so many different saints out there. If we don't expose young people and us who are not as young as we used to be, but yeah. still <laughs> are pretty young. <laughs> um, but if we don't expose ourselves uh, to the lives of saints, when you look at you know, Butler's Lives of the Saints, four volumes, I mean, yeah. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds mm -hmm. of saints out there, mm -hmm. all these different personalities. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I grew up with the idea that, you know, my patron saint is St. Francis, my, my confirmation saint. And to be a saint, you had to have this kind of quiet, contemplative life like the St. Francis seemed to have, in my opinion. But he was a pretty fiery speaker. And Absolutely. Yeah. But I said to my spiritual director early on, I said, I, I, you know, his friends beat him up and threw him in a ditch and he laughed about it. I said, Father, I don't think I could do that. Yeah. If my friends started a fight with me, I'd have to fight back. <laughs> I just, you know, and I've done it. You know? but, but years ago. <laughs> but my point is, my personality didn't seem to fit that. And he shot back at me firmly and he said, God wants to make St. Doug out of you. Yeah. He doesn't want to make Doug into a St. Francis, yeah, we're all which was really helpful to me to realize that the personality that we have been given, God wants to use that and make that. So some of us are boisterous and, 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 and intense, and some are quiet and shy, but God can make a saint out of any of that, can't yeah. he? Yeah, St. Dominic didn't want people to imitate him exactly. He pointed towards a life, and he wanted, there's many, many Dominican saints, and he didn't want anybody to imitate him exactly. He wanted to imitate you know, uh, being consistent in prayer and in frequent, uh, frequently the sacrament mm -hmm. and in study and in sharing the fruits of your studies with others to bring them into the church. So, um, and people do that in different ways. Everybody is called to share what's closest to their hearts right. with people. And uh, but the prayer life and the sacramental life and the like devotion to the Blessed Mother, mm -hmm. uh, to our Lord, the Blessed Sacrament, those mm -hmm. should be a mainstay for all of us, regardless. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. but, but the individual personalities and gifts, those are going to vary. They vary. And, and God can do amazing things with those if we let Him. We're all uh, created in the image and likeness of God and like fingerprints, no, no person has right. the same fingerprints. And we each reflect something about God that nobody else can. And that's why God wants to bring out you know, the saint in each one of us. Right. Powerful. Now, right now, you, you're with, um, you, you started Kindly Light um, uh, uh, Media with uh, another individual or two. Yeah, and I was a chaplain at New York University, and um, one of the film students there was graduating, and we just began this project because uh, he didn't have a job, and we just went out there and started doing one documentary, and, it, and it's growing from yeah. there. That's awesome. So important to media, as we talked about, you know, so so much on the show. Father and I talk about the importance of really engaging. And John Paul II, you know, blessed John Paul II, talked a lot about engaging in the culture. Don't run from, but get out there and connect. Benedict, the same thing. Before I was a chaplain at NYU, I was a chaplain at a cancer hospital in New York, Sloan Kettering, and it's a very heavy ministry. I've been a priest for over 12 years, and those two years uh, serving in a cancer ward was more intense than mm -hmm. over 10 years anywhere else, and. I used to, uh, in the evening one day, go down and, and take some classes at the NYU Film School, the Documentary Film School, but I found that more challenging than being on the cancer ward because <laughs> the school wasn't just secular, it was nihilistic, it was dark, oh, wow. and I was like, oh gosh, we have to reach these students. Here's these gifted students who are going to be creating films and documentary documentaries and have the potential of telling great stories, but if their philosophy is mm. off, what, what are they going to tell, you yeah. know? And uh, it's certainly not going to bring any light, it's going to bring darkness. Right. So we took this poem of Blessed John Henry Newman, Kindly Light, in which we named our uh, media company uh, off of, uh, it's a non-for-profit, and we basically wanted to bring light where there was darkness, which is what mm -hmm. his poem's about. And film is often described as um, playing with light, capturing light on film, and uh, painting, painting with light. and that's what we need to do. We need to be in di all different forms, uh, as you guys were talking about, all different forms of, of media and uh, film and documentary is one of them. Mm -hmm. And we need to be at these top schools where they have these gifted students, but if they aren't contemplating, like the Great Books program, if they aren't mm -hmm. contemplating the classics, 
um, there's, there's a great loss of the use of their talents. Right. So the formation of the heart of these, of these um, creators of film. And heart speaks to heart, critical. you know. It's just yeah. not logic. We love logic as Dominicans uh, right. uh, with Aristotle and uh, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, but heart speaks to heart as well, and, so, and we need to use that. Right, too. absolutely. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely, I, I agree 100% with this. So Fulton Sheen, this, we're about to see a clip here on Fulton Sheen. Um, do you need to set it up at all, or does it speak I'll set itself? it up just a little bit. I, it, it was a, I felt very privileged. It's God's providence, uh, again, where he was uh, one of my favorite authors, still is. And I was given this film reel that was very old. It was from 1972, and it wasn't open before. And when I put it on an old film reel, uh, it took me a while to find an old film reel to, to play it, <laughs> I saw this great homily that he, that he had given. And these Dominicans down at Washington, D.C., had him come in to do this talk on the importance of preaching. And it's 1972, and it's a very powerful homily, uh, which has never been seen before. And then it was given out to several parishes, so only a handful of parishes have seen this. So it's practically never been seen before. And uh, this is just a little clip of it. Okay. And it's only a nine minute homily, so we're trying to expand that out with other uh, great preachers and uh, Father Andrew Apostoli, who's working his cause, and we're just talking about the importance of preaching, like the homily that drew me home, uh, and these timeless truths uh, of the saints, you know, sharing that, and the, mm -hmm. the courage to share that, even when it's counterintuitive, um, even when it's talking about uh, preaching the cross and yeah. Christ crucified. Well, and how, how, how important, especially in, in our day today, so. All right, let's take a look at this uh, clip on uh, Venerable. Archbishop Fulton Sheen. What was the first word of our Lord's public life? That's the key to preaching. It was come. Come. Come to me, be inflamed with my truth, be on fire with my love. And what was the last word of our Lord's public life? It was go. First we come, then we go. If we do not draw our knowledge, our love from Christ, say, and then the Holy Spirit coming, we have nothing to give the people. So we have to first come to Jesus, to be given the message, to be given the life, to be given the power of the Holy Spirit. Then we can go. The preacher has to be able to say that and have people follow him. And when he said, come, he didn't say, you know, come, I'm going to go here, because they said, where are you staying? He said, well, just come. He didn't tell them where he was going. He says to the two men on the Emmaus Road, how is it you didn't understand what was going on? And he preaches to them there. And they said, did not our hearts burn within us? When you're sent, you do the will of the one who sends you. And so that's what Bishop Sheen was saying. We don't go out there and preach our own gospel. We don't preach our own message. We have to preach what Christ and the church give us. That's why we come first to learn these things. Then once we're formed, we go. You turn from Peter, denying Jesus at the fire to the very first pages of the Acts of the Apostles, and there he's preaching with this amazing force and authority, even in a way that would make you think that he was, uh, that he had never done anything wrong, because in the course of the sermon he says, you crucified the author of life. Well, if anyone was guilty of that, it was Peter himself for denying Jesus. But the people are so moved by this, they come up to him at the end of the homily, of the sermon, and they say, Tell us what to do. And they are so captivated, not simply because they've been taught something, but because they've seen the one who has enabled this ignorant fisherman to be on fire with God's divine word, that they want to become that way themselves. This is a sort of documentary that strikes me just in seeing that clip. Um, makes me think about what our Lord talks about, finding a treasure and selling all you have to buy the land that that treasure's on, and you find it in the ground there. And discovering something 
powerful about a human being in this world that, you know, you, you know, for some of us, we lived during his time. I was born in 65. Um, not knowing a lot about him in my early years as a Catholic, but then something like this can come along and can wake us up and open us up to something completely new, deep and rich and powerful. He was prophetic. It was 1972. He knew there were troubles coming into the church and he was already seeing certain things being played out. And the homily gets very strong at certain points. You get a, you know, a little bit of a flavor for you it get there. A sense that he could, but he's later, later, fire later on, it's, it's there's no, you know, it's beyond a shadow of a doubt. It's it's clear. It's he's, off the chain. It's, it's, <laughs> he, he, it's a different tone than the life is uh, worth living. I mean, he's mm -hmm. he's fired up and rightly so, and he's being prophetic because he knows the church is heading for dark times, and he's trying to keep people focused mm -hmm. and keep people on the right path. And it comes about, it turns, but much later, you know, and uh, it's, so I think it's very prophetic in, in that yeah. sense. And he has a way of speaking and giving analogies, which as you're saying are timeless. And I think it'll always speak to each generation. And yeah. he has some real gems in the way. He, he took a lot of time in prayer before he preached, and then he shared the fruits of that contemplation. And it's because of spending time with our Lord in front of the Blessed Sacrament that he was able to preach effectively. Yeah. And I think too, he always stayed close to the scriptures, like those priest retreats. I've listened to all those tapes. And They're great. Yeah, he's explaining the word of God. And as we said on one of these shows we recorded today, <laughs> the word of God has its own power, right? Yeah. I so. went to Franciscan University of Steubenville for a year and a half while I was discerning. I already had a uh, undergraduate's degree, but I went there to study philosophy and discern my vocation. And uh, at the time it was uh, Bishop Chaput who came out for a retreat during the summertime. And I, uh, uh, met him at the airport, drove him to the conference and back, and we, we had uh, discussions in the way to and from the airport. And he, he told me, because I was I told him I was discerning a vocation, he says, you know, somebody could speak to you for hours, you could read tons of books, but our Lord basically says this first word ever in Scripture is come, come. And he doesn't explain to them everything. He, he basically has this command of you, you have to begin living the life. And with, with the priesthood and religious life, I, I think that's it. You can't discern it from the outside. You have to discern it by taking that next step. After you've discerned, you know, with the vocation director that it right. seems that you're being called in this direction. So you have to take that leap of faith no matter what. And I think uh, for, the, for that particular vocation, and uh, I think it's something that's uh, very encouraging the way right. he brings this out. That's powerful, powerful. Just a little clip there alone. Okay, we're gonna run to a break. Don't go away. We'll be back with much more from Father Gabriel Gillen after this. Welcome back to Life on the Rock with Father Gabriel Gill and I'm Doug Berry. This is Father Mark, Rock House Compadres. You're in the Rock House. Thank you for being with us. Father Gabriel, before the break, we saw a fantastic clip uh, on Fulton Sheen and how can people get more information on this? The DVD is not finished yet, but uh, what do they need to do to find out more about this? They can go to the website. It's www.kindlylight.org and under kindlylight.org, you can see our upcoming project in which it shows that this is in the pre-production uh, stage and they can pre-order if they want the DVD so they can get the Fulton Sheen homily and, in and of itself and also the piece that we're talking about, the importance of preaching today. Right. And is there, a, uh, you still need funds raised for this? We still need funds raised. We're gonna do it no matter what, but uh, you know, if, if people kick in, we'll give them a DVD so they can be part of it from the beginning and they can, they can get it through that website. I would think anybody out there watching or listening right now who has benefited from Fulton Sheen's preaching over the years, um, if you remember the angel on the blackboard, you know, there was a time when he was put on television opposite Milton Berle and his ratings went above Uncle Milty. Yeah, he was number one. <laughs> he also taught, he was uh, brought, he taught for years before he was famous at Catholic University of America. He taught philosophy mm -hmm. and it was a Dominican who got him that job there and he 
was uh, a great, a great professor, a great teacher before he was known nationally on radio then TV. Uh, a great communicator. So for those of you out there who have been touched by Archbishop Fulton Sheen's life, uh, benefited spiritually, especially from his um, his uh, his work and and his service to God. Um, go to this website, kindlylight.org. That's correct. And take a look and pray about possibly supporting this and making this happen so more people in the world can benefit from this. Um, okay, Father, we have other things, though, that you are involved in. You're a man of many skills, talents, and irons in the fire, as the saying goes. Uh, I go where God sends me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's never boring. <laughs> seems to be a theme with you. With yeah. your um, tell uh, tell Come, us now. go. It's, you know. Exactly. Yeah, we just heard about that. Um, this next project, next clip we're going to be seeing in a little bit here is about uh, five priests ordained. Yeah, our last, you know, we'd, uh, we had five guys ordained to the priesthood. We have a lot of guys joining. We had a class of 21. We may have a class of 18 this year. There's... Um, there's a, a lot of, there's over a thousand uh, friars uh, for the Dominican order studying for the priesthood throughout the world. And there's a great renewal, there's a great hope where their sin abounds, as St. Paul says, grace abounds. And even though there's a lot of problems, there's a lot of problems today. There's a lot there's, of grace in America right now. There's a lot right of now. grace. So you see the, all the young people here today and you see yeah. uh, how uh, a group comes out, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas in California or Steubenville, and you see then they, begin teaching the next generation and it keeps growing. Right. So uh, even though uh, we don't have the, the uh, same programs that other groups and the same uh, money behind it, we have God's grace, which is all we need. Well, very exciting too, you think about the time of St. Dominic, when Dominic preached and lived, um, all those that benefited from his teaching. It was his time in the world to pass on the, the baton of the faith to the next person. And they lost the faith where, faith where he was. They went off with this uh, heresy and he brought them back. So, you know, one person uh, can influence others and uh, then other people get behind that cause and you can see a tremendous uh, influence that, that somebody who says yes to God, no matter where they're calling them, to, to counter something and, and bring people the truth. And the stories of Dominic, St. Dominic, are, are incredible. Um, uh, you know, the Secret of the Rosary that, you know, St. Louis Marita Montfort wrote, you know, so many stories in there. And one in particular stands out, I just came upon not too long ago again, was the, uh, um, an Albigensian who was, uh, who had given to the heresy, Albigensian heresy there, was brought before St. Dominic. And, um, he was he was possessed with fifteen thousand demons. That's a lot. <laughs> that's, that's a lot. Um, it's I, I, I won't I will not make a political comment on that. <laughs> but but I mean you think about you think about fifteen thousand demons in, in a person's soul and and Dominic had that was given that gift that power to deal with this sort of thing and this was because the man was attacking the fifteen mysteries of the rosary, yeah. and he was forced to speak as to who was the greatest threat at that time and the demons cried out that it was Dominic. He was the greatest threat yeah. on the earth at the time yeah. that they feared the most because of how many souls he snatched from them because of his devotion to the rosary. Yeah, yeah. the rosary is powerful and uh, St. Dominic certainly uh, spread that devotion in a powerful way and, and countless others after him. And he also spent all night in conversation with an innkeeper where he was staying somewhere. And you know, he had a busy schedule the next day, but he stayed all up uh, night Clearing, clearing up uh, misconceptions that, that this man had about the faith. And at the end, in the morning, the man came back to the faith. So it showed that he wasn't concerned about the numbers. He would spend all night mm, just to convert just one. one person. That's and uh, that's, yeah, it's, uh, he, he loved with an uncalculating love. And uh, mm. it's, uh, that's how God loves us. That's good, uncalculating love. The next clip, uh, Five Paths to the Priesthood. Uh, so this is a, a short piece that we did, and it was just showing uh, every story, even though we have a lot of vocations, every story is unique. So we wanted to start telling these stories and sharing these stories. And that's uh, a, a short piece that we did of uh, guys who were just ordained and they're just sharing their path to the priesthood. Excellent, all right, here we go folks. Five paths to the priesthood. It's always very humbling to realize that God has uh, called, has thought about this for me from all eternity. I couldn't really articulate really is, is this sense that it's um, finally here, the imminence of it, you know, right before the ordination that um, it seemed that so many different strands of God's providential guidance were coming together and that this was finally coming about. All the way up till I would say about a month out, you know, I, 
I was kind of thinking, man, this is going to take, this has been taking forever, it's finally here, I'm so excited that this is... And then within, uh, you know, those last four weeks, kind of the awesome power of, of being called to be a priest, just being a priest of Jesus Christ started to weigh heavier on me and I started to think, I'm not ready for this, you know. So even though it was nine years, I was thinking, you know, in those last few weeks before ordination, there is no way that I can do this, you know, because I started to think about all my uh, weaknesses and, you know, the drawbacks to me as a person. It just was something that seemed so much higher and greater than something that I could be associated with. Um, so it was just an interesting kind of movement in that regard. At that moment when I felt the oil on my hands, you know, if I was going to tra trace it to one moment, that I knew that I was, had deep fa this deep faith that I would be able to handle everything that was going to come down my way. Um, and so it was sort of this ebb and flow of angst and uh, anticipation. Once I was actually ordained, uh, you know, that that deep sense of peace and that uh, the grace that just washed over was um, it was just something that uh, I'll always treasure and I'm um, very very thankful for. Yeah, I've been to so many ordinations uh, over the years, and uh, it, it was just extremely surreal to believe that this was me being ordained uh, at this ordination that I wasn't there as a acolyte or as a musician or something else, um, to be the one, to be the deacon there, to be ordained a priest was uh, very, very hard to believe. You know, such an incredible gift and grace. Um, uh, I remember just kind of the whole day throughout the Mass and afterwards feeling like, you know, I wasn't really walking on the ground, you know, just kind of uh, floating through the whole thing. Uh, I think lifted up by many, many prayers, but also just caught up in the very uh, otherworldliness uh, of the whole experience. The ordination itself uh, for me went very quickly. I, I kept wishing uh, you know things would kind of go in slow motion so I could take it in more deeply um, but it was kind of one thing after another and um, just uh, you know it was just an overwhelming uh, experience of God's gift, God's grace, God's love and the days that followed uh, you know just an outpouring of uh, of joy and love from so many people, uh, family and friends, but people who love the church and love the priesthood and are just so happy, uh, you know, to have more priests in the church. And so to be part of that and to, to be able to offer to these people for the first time uh, the Mass and the sacraments uh, was a great, great privilege, great joy. The first priestly blessing I gave was to my parents, um, which was uh, just a great joy. Uh, my parents have always supported my vocation of the priesthood since I was a young child and uh, so to be able to, uh, to act as a priest and ask, call down God's blessing upon them um, felt like, you know, uh, just a, something that I could do, a small gesture I could do to thank them for all that they've done to bring me to this point. And, uh, likewise with my brothers, um, it was just a great blessing and my grandmother was there also uh, who's been a great kind of pillar of faith in our family and uh, so to be able to bless all of them and to um, to, to use the, the priestly power of intercession to uh, ask God's grace upon them was a, was a real blessing. There's something that, that always always strikes me about the power of a priest, you know, and I'm, I'm very honored and blessed to be able to work with Father Mark, you know, for so many years now and have, have him as a good friend. But to know that you men are given this unique, unbelievable gift by God to absolve people from sin, mm -hmm. to reorder them and get us back in that position to be able to enter into heaven when we die. 
is an incredible thing, I think. Um, and I regularly I ask priests this question as I travel around and such, what's, what's that like for you? Hmm. Well, having received the sacrament of reconciliation, you know, you're, you're humbled by it. And to give that gift, there's a greater, I mean, several theologians have, have described it in saints, there's a greater power in absolution raising somebody back to a state of grace than there is raising somebody back from the dead to life and because it's a higher order and it's 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 very humbling and it, it's god working through us i think uh we both realize you know it's we're just god's instruments uh in this and uh, but it, nonetheless it's it's one of the most beautiful things i often when i go to a parish i'm traveling around somewhere I'll see they may only have confessions on Saturday for a half an hour on Saturday. Mm -hmm. So on, this, on the Sunday when I'm preaching, I'll just afterwards, and I don't even preach on confession, I'll say, excuse me for not greeting you at the back of the church, but if anybody would like, I'm going to hear confessions. And every time I do that in a place that doesn't have regular confessions, I'm there for two hours. And it's people that haven't been for many years. So it's... Um, it's a lost sacrament, as Blessed John Paul II described it. Uh, but once you make it available, uh, people come. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. You know, I, I, for um, 21 years or so, I've been doing this one-man drama of the Passion of Christ. I act out about 10 different characters. And one of, the, one of the things that I'm portraying in this Passion is Christ. And I'm, I'm actually speaking as if it's His voice. You know, I'm, I'm, and most of the time I do this, I do this in churches. And most of the time, the Blessed Sacrament is in the tabernacle right behind me. Mm. And I'm on the steps or on the floor right in front of the altar. And over the years, more and more, I've gotten to this almost feeling a, a, a trembling inside before I walk out to share this with people, thinking here I am portraying his voice, his mannerisms, his posture as I'm speaking about certain aspects within the Passion. But to be priests and actually be in, you know, in persona here, Christ in persona is, is, is obviously on a whole different level. It's above my security clearance, but as you would say. But, but on, that, on that same note, as somebody else who played Christ, uh, Jim Caviezel, he's right. good friends with an Irish Dominican, and he told uh, Father Paul Murray this story about when one of the Roman soldiers who was of uh, Italian descent was doing the, the scene of the Passion and is, and is striking mm -hmm. Jim Caviezel, who's playing Christ, his mother, when he saw that, his Italian mother, when he saw that, wouldn't speak to him for over a month. <laughs> it's like, Mom, it's a, <laughs> like, an actor. No. <laughs> so, wow. no, it's good, to, you know, it's good that it's because of the person that we stand in the place of. There's yeah. that reverence uh, in acting, uh, which the grand, uh, with the mother had, and, mm -hmm. uh, but in, in the sacraments where it's not acting, you're actually standing in persona Christi. It's, it's very humbling, and, uh, but it's God's work, and then he calls us to it. We would never do it on our own if we weren't called. It's yeah, incredible. Well, thank you both for being priests and for all you priests out there, thank you very much for saying yes to Christ. Um, and that last piece is just speaking about that. I mean, there's, right. there's uh, 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 thankfully, there's many people joining uh, many different orders, not just ours, but we have over worldwide over a thousand guys studying for the priesthood. And so that piece really what inspires me is, and I'm sure you feel this way in working with young people and, and in the show as well, Doug, it's you feel like you're just you know, allowing a leg up for the next generation. They're the ones who are really going to do great things. And that's what I, I feel when I see all these new guys coming up. I, uh, these guys are going to do great things and we're just, we, you know, we're just kind of preparing the way for, for, for that, next, for that well, next generation. Yeah, you know, we hear the quote a lot of times that... Um, you know, the, uh, the, the youth of the future of the church. And, and I like that, but I always think that that's incomplete. And I've said this on the show a lot, and I want this attributed to me on my gravestone one day. <laughs> <laughs> I tell my kids this. The future of anything is only as good as it's trained to be. Hmm. And, you know, I mean, and, and there's a fair amount in our society that's not being trained that well. Yeah. And so we do need well-trained priests, well-trained yeah. young people, well, like, like the school we have here represented here tonight. Um, we need to be training the next generation well yeah. in yeah. goodness and truth and holiness for there to be a 
a good future. I, I think that's one of the reasons why people ask often uh, why we, they think our formation program is doing well. And I, I, that's exactly what I say. The young people want good training and they look around and if they think they're not going to get a good formation, they don't go to the program. So if you have a good program, they'll come. All right, that's, that's a great point there, Father. Uh, the next video um, on the Catholic uh, Center at NYU, uh, before we go to that real quick, you, you talked about a little bit of darkness in, in the film world and such and about training. And here we've got this great video now. Um, in fact, we just cut to the video and then come back and let's, let's dig into it for Absolutely. the rest of the show. All right, here, uh, video on the Catholic Center at NYU, icon of the new evangelization. We're not afraid to say this is where the Catholic Church belongs. We are about the intersection of faith and reason. We are about culture. We are about learning. And we want to be right smack dab in the middle of this public square, of this university, because we are not afraid. I love the idea that the Catholic community has a space in such a secular university. There's been a Catholic center here since 1964, but um, a few years ago it was decided that a new campus building would come here and the Catholic center would exist as the first floor of this new center. And the new building offers a variety of facilities. There's a chapel, of course, uh, meeting rooms and a common room where the students can come and hang out, meet each other. Having a Catholic center on the university campus has had a tremendous impact. Um, it's of the 40,000 students that attend the university, it is said that approximately 18,000 of them are Catholic. I use the lounge area um, quite a bit during the week, so I'm always in here because, you know, the fireplace, it's quiet and it's somewhere you can kind of see people, um, interact a little bit, but also be productive. I think that it's the perfect place to study. I just really like it. There's daily mass here at 515 with an hour of adoration beforehand and approximately 9 to 6 p.m. The friars are available for spiritual direction, confession, to answer questions, to um, really hang out with the students. Um, and then there are multiple, multiple events that we'll meet here in the evenings um, or the late afternoons. And you can really see that different groups are coming together into the same location for the first time. I find it to be a second home because I am commuting and uh, it can be difficult sometimes, so it's great to be able to come in and be able to meet my friends here, do my homework here, make lunch, um, just be able to have a place on campus to go to that's comfortable and welcoming. The new building offers a kitchen where they can prepare food because, as you know, students like to eat and to drink and it uh, brings them together. Regardless of where you are, it's tough being a Catholic, but so far it's been easier for me to be a Catholic here in New York for some reason. And, I, and I, now that you mention it, I think it is because of this Catholic center. The Catholic community here, I mean, we see each other more now, as from, from in my experience, just by having this space to meet. So we get to meet new people. It is a very tight-knit community, very loving, very supportive. Uh, I love everyone here, and it's always a joy to get together with them, whether at meetings or outside of meetings, just hanging out, and we have good times together and help each other grow in our faith. We like to present it as a home from home because many students, new students particularly, find it difficult to settle if they come from, say, smaller cities, smaller towns. To come to the hurly-burly of New York is very disorientating for them. So here they can find uh, friends, uh, community, a space for prayer, a space for developing their, their life of faith. And the missionaries in the past went out on campus and they had these students, uh, they engaged students, but they didn't have a place to send them uh, as easily. They didn't have this big beacon of Catholic uh, identity that was sitting there on campus. And now we have students walking by every day who will come in and say, I'm Catholic. Uh, and whatever degree of their faith they're in, they say, I'm, I want to get involved, I want to, I want to develop my faith further. The aim of, of, the, of the chaplaincy and the, the chaplains would be to broaden the general religious and cultural vision of those who come here. 
First and foremost, we want the Catholic Center to be a place of prayer, that people know that um, this is not just a hangout place. This is a place where God is worshiped and where people come to be connected to God and come to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And as Catholics, that has to remain first and foremost. And so any place that's dedicated uh, by the church and for the church's use has to have that as its primary goal. So, so Kindly Light Media does, does this clip as well. You guys are just all over the place. We're starting to do different documentaries and uh, it's, we're trying to get film students who are very gifted and to use their gifts to serve the church and tell great stories. So. Excellent. And so, what's, what's the website again, Father, for our radio listeners? Kindlylight.org. So yeah. under kindlylight.org they can find it and they'll be able to keep track of our future projects as they come out. And if they're interested in joining the Dominican Order, they can find out through that website too? They can eventually get there, yes. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Google, uh, if they Google Dominican Friars, they'll, they'll find it. Well, yeah. fantastic. Well, keep up the great work, and it was great to have you on the show. We Thank you. Uh, back uh, again. Same here. Right, thank you very much. Father, as only you can take us out. Well, Father and I both uh, will sure. give a blessing. May our Heavenly Father shine His face upon you. May He give you His peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and, and the, the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. We'll see you next week.